My name is uh, Nancy Chandy, and uh, what I want to share today is about my um, experience, uh, basically my testimony of how Jesus revealed himself to me, took me to heaven, and also took me to hell. I was in front of this this huge uh, gate, this gate which with, it, 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 sh it was shining like uh, with, with so much of radiance and so much of light and, uh, and the gate was like, it was as if covered with, with jewels or, or you know, precious stones and there was so much of light and glory coming from this gate where I, I was having a hard time even looking and, and the gate just opens and an angel comes out and the angel says, come in. It's just as you read in the word, the streets are made of gold and it, there's, there's, there's this brilliance and light, there's this joy. And, and one thing that I really experienced stepping into heaven is peace, is a peace, uh, uh, you know, peace and love. It's like, you know, all your cares and all your worries just, just fade away and you just forget about everything that, about, about the earth. And uh, after some time, I knew that there was, there was someone coming towards, there was some, some power, some, some force coming towards me. But, but at the same time, this feeling of love beyond explanation, you know, was coming towards me. And I turned and the next thing I went boom to the floor and it was Jesus. And Jesus has said, come, I have things to show you. And the, and the next thing I know, I'm, in, I'm standing in this beautiful garden beautiful garden garden filled with flowers of all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors that I have never seen on this earth uh, uh, you know with different blends of colors there was very tiny flowers to big flowers medium-sized flowers, all kinds and the beauty about this garden was that the flowers were singing praises to the king the flowers were singing praises the the fragrance the the smell it was just so um, so beautiful where you could just stand there and just just worship God you know and the next place is I found myself standing in this uh, river uh, this crystal clear river and it, it was so clear it's like as if you could see all the way down and I was standing right in the middle but not sinking I, I was not sinking but I, I was, it was so peaceful and it was crystal clear so pure the water you know one thing about being there in heaven was that J Jesus didn't have to explain to me this is you know this is that or this is that there was a knowing in my heart it was as though he was communicating to me in my in my spirit uh, in you know and, and and I just turned and I saw this huge throne there was no end no beginning of this throne and this throne was made of precious gems i mean the i mean it was it was hard for me to even look at it but it was huge uh, and from from this uh, if i could say from the center from the center of this throne was this river was flowing from the center of the throne and going all through heaven or i mean all around heaven from the river the next place that i was was jesus said look and what I saw was rows and rows and rows of, uh, you know, it, it seemed like it was some, some construction taking place, rows and rows of it. And on top of each of the doors, there was a plaque. And on, on this plaque, and what I was allowed to see was especially this plaque, and each of the plaque had a name. And the name was, it was not English, but it was a name, and I just knew it was the name of, the, of, of a person. Of each time someone gives their life to the Lord, there is a celebration, there is, there is jubilee in heaven that takes place. And immediately there is, uh, the, there is a mansion that is being, being built for every child of God that, whose name is written in the book of the Lamb. And after I had seen all of this, I said, Jesus, I don't want to go back. I want to stay with you. I want to be with you forever. I want to stay here. And he, and he said, there's one more place I have to show you. And the next place that the Lord took me to was dark. It was really dark. I was standing like, like the edge of, it was like standing on the edge of a cliff. And he said, look down. And even before I could look down, I, I, I could hear these, the screaming, this, this no, the, uh, you know, screaming in pain, screaming in agony, screaming out, help, help, help. And it was pitch dark. But I knew that Jesus allowed me at that moment in time to see what was down there. And what I saw was, was horrific. It was, it was horrible. I, I saw bodies of men and women. They were naked bodies of men and women just running and screaming and, and crying out for help. I saw these these demonic, scary, ugly, demonic figures were reminding them, reminding them of the mistakes they have done, constantly reminding them, reminding them. And, and, and then the next thing that I saw was these, these claws, these creatures, they had these claws, they would just tear the backs of the men and the women and, 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 the, and they would be just screaming, the men and the women that they were, they were being scratched and torn apart were just screaming. And, and the agony is that 
you never die there. I, I, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't say a word. It was just, I was just breaking. It's like I could feel the compassion that Jesus had. Je I looked at Jesus' face and I saw compassion in his eyes. But there's nothing he could do too, because they chose their destiny. The, the smell was like, if you have smelled sulfur, uh, uh, times a gazillion or a million times, that smell, the stench was horrible. The stench was horrible, and the darkness is it's like a terrorizing darkness in there. And, and Jesus said, look, and, and, and I looked, and I saw faces of people. There was like so, just faces just popping up, uh, popping up down there. And I looked, and I said, but Jesus, these people are alive, because I, there are some that I, did, I knew. And I, and, I, and I knew some of them as to be even ministers. I said, but they're alive. And Jesus said, this is why I'm sending you back, to speak the truth to speak the tr truth because my church is perishing, my body is perishing. And after that was said, I was back. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there is no other place in between. You go either to heaven or you go either to, uh, to hell. And now is the time it, you know, to, to examine our hearts, just examine our hearts. Where are we going? Where is our destiny going to be? What kind of a life are we living? Are we are we one when we are outside uh, in front of people and living another life behind closed walls? We can fool man, we can fool our family, we can fool uh, you know, our spouses, but God Almighty sees everything. Holy Spirit sees everything, but He is a merciful and a compassionate God. He is standing with arms open wide in front of us, in front of you today and saying, come. All we have to do is to surrender and repent. It's time for the church to come back to the first love. I think that is the punchline of today. Is this uh, the message for the hour? Come back to the first love. Come back. If it's for the it's for the church, the sleeping giant to wake up. So, so today choose heaven or hell. Law practice is a stressful environment and you're dealing with a lot of very difficult situations. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach every morning feeling that stress. He just was burdened by work. I mean, that was always on his mind. You know, it was, it was a hard thing for him to turn off on the weekends or, or to get away from it. I was just focused so intently on my career that I was letting what's really important fall by the wayside. Jeffrey Thompson's law practice didn't take just his time and energy. The fast pace and the constant stress also took a toll on his body. I maintained that stress and it continued to work on me and it also continued to work on my body. And eventually it broke down. I began having stomach pains, severe stomach pains, that, that I initially, I just had no idea what it was. I thought I had an appendix rupture. Jeffrey had developed diverticulitis, a painful condition that attacks the intestinal wall. Months of natural treatments had failed, and his condition had become so advanced, he needed surgery to remove part of his intestine. But what looked like a textbook operation left him suspended between life and death. And I woke up to a surgeon pulling a sheet off of my stomach. And as I looked down, I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. And then I looked into the surgeon's eyes and I could see concern on his face. He had been hemorrhaging for almost 24 hours. And they had continually given him blood but that was hemorrhaging into his abdomen and they didn't know it into his stomach. It was frightening. I've never seen anyone so, so pale, but his, his lips were just completely white. My internal clock told me that I was getting ready to die and I only had a few seconds of consciousness left. I reached up to grab my wife. I was just wanting to tell her how much I loved her and tell her that I was getting ready to leave her. And, and I went to him and it was right after that I lost him. You know, I could tell he, he left. And he, he took my hand and then he was gone. And my life came to my center torso and I began to rise out of my body up into that room. Everything was going haywire down below me. They were saying, I'm going to lose him. They were doing everything they knew to, to keep him alive at that point. It, it looked like it was a disaster going on. It was the sweetest day of my life. I never had any pain, and I never had any fear. As Jeffrey's spirit hovered above his body, a light appeared. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It started in the center of the room toward the ceiling and began to filter out into that room and I was immediately drawn to it. And as it began to hit objects in that room, color came flooding out like I've never seen before. My senses became enhanced. I could see everything in that room with perfect clarity. There was an entire dimension that we just simply don't see on earth. I've never been more alive than I was at that moment. It was incredible. 
I suddenly had an overwhelming sense of God's presence, of his love, of his peace, of his joy. The thing that was just so incredible to me is how the maker of this universe, who can make the sun, the moon, and the stars in this earth and us, can come down and hold me and comfort me and love me as if I'm the only person in the universe. And I remember thinking about the prodigal son. That's what came to mind for me, that long lost son that had gone out and strayed and he had come back home. And his father was coming out to hold him and to love him and to welcome him back. That's what was happening to me. It's the sweetest love there is. I told him I wanted to go with him. And then I had a fleeting thought. But what about Madeline, my wife, and what about Will? My sweet wife is just falling apart down below me, and I'd never seen her that way. And I'm up here in complete comfort, in complete peace, in complete joy. And then God told me internally I was going to go back. And I remember jolting in my bed, and I opened my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I'm looking at the surgeon, and he's saying, I'm losing him. We've got to get him back in surgery. Jeffrey was rushed back into surgery where doctors stopped the bleeding. When he finally regained consciousness, Jeffrey had a new understanding of God's amazing love and presence in his life. God loves you more than you've ever known. He knows your circumstances. He, he, he knows what you're going through. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach. I wake up with joy in my heart. I know he's with me. You can't go through something like that and not be a changed man. He has a peace about him. He's a very a very peaceful and very centered. He's really not fearful of anything now. Jeffrey's recovery was long and difficult, but the peace, joy, and love of God he found on the day he faced death is now with him in everything he does. There's a peace and a love there like uh, I can't describe to you. And, and it's, it's an entirely different way of living. I've never enjoyed living more, and, and I understand now what's really important. I want to live for God, and I pray that he'll give me the opportunity to continue to do that. I went my whole life not believing that that hell was real. I said, you know, I didn't want to believe in all that dark stuff, you know, I, there's no hell. That's what I thought, but there is a hell. Jordan Samuel believes there's a hell because he believes he's been there. I could hear cackling, like laughing, <laughs> like laughs at with demons. I could hear stuff. Earlier in his life, he never believed hell existed. If I live my life and do the best I can do, like karma-wise, you know, what goes around comes around, I'll just be the best man that I can be. He grew up in Edmonton, British Columbia with a single mom and went to a Catholic school. He was naturally inquisitive and asked a lot of questions about Jesus. How could one man come and just die for me? And, you know, who is this guy? And for that, he was kicked out of class. But my third time getting kicked out of class, I remember saying, you know what? I never want to know this Jesus guy. Whoever he is, he just gets me in trouble and I just get kicked out of class and no one wants to give me answers about him. And this is how people treat me. I don't want to know. His mom married and for the next 15 years, Jordan says his family life was great. Then his mom and stepdad divorced. Jordan was devastated. The only way he knew how to deal with the pain was to rebel. So whether that was drinking and driving with buddies and underage driving, stealing cars and, you know, getting stereos and having the thrill of, you know, almost someone catching me, but not quite. For the next four years, Jordan continued his reckless behavior, but he wanted to turn his life around. So he stopped selling drugs and started working for an oil rig company. I was making really good money at a really good house. After work one day, Jordan decided to smoke some pot he didn't know the pipe he used was laced with crack cocaine, something he had never done before. Jordan was sure he was dying. I can feel my heart going, boop, 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 slowing down, boop, 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 and then like fluttering. Jordan believes in that moment he went to hell. All these women and all the things you think you want in the world, money, car, success, you know, um, all these things that I had and I was driving, I was just loving it. And then all of a sudden this car broke down. All of a sudden these women turned to huge, huge demons and the, it, it earthquaked. And I look behind me and I can hear screaming. It's all red and black. Ah, turn around, turn around, get out of here. It sounded like people burning, 
people that were just just burning that couldn't find a cure or a fix to anything. It was just the worst. And I remember being afraid, gripping the steering wheel. And all of a sudden, it was like, I'm back to my body in the trailer room. As Jordan was taking what he thought was his last breath, he made a declaration of faith to God. And my heart's going, boom. Like the last beat. Not even knowing why, I just said, I believe. And all of a sudden, boom. I'm gone. That's when Jordan says Jesus pulled him out of hell and took him to heaven. He was all in white. He was in a robe when I saw him. And he looked at me and he wears a crown on his head. And his eyes are fierce like fire, but there is no like, like color. It's just bright looking at me. And he's just, he's like, just, he just is amazing. You're at his feet. You're at the Lord's feet because he's just perfect. You worship him because he's the almighty. You worship him because he's, he's, he saved us. Then, Jordan believes he was standing before God. The Lord went to the right hand of the Father, and I began to get judged by the Father. And it was the worst, because what happened was he, he played secrets in my heart that I locked with that I only knew that I ever did. And I thought no one could do, and I could feel what God felt. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Like, it was the worst feeling. And he just comes in, and he hugs you. He says, all is forgiven. My old heart was, was broken. My old heart needed fixing, and God gave me a new heart. All of a sudden, he told me he loved me, that I'm not alone, that I've never been alone. He showed me all the times in my life where I thought I was lucky, that I thought I was alone, but how his hand was always just upon me, and he was always right there pursuing me nonstop. He hugged me again, told me he loved me, and all of a sudden, I was like, Whoosh. I'm back in my trailer room on the floor. I grabbed the Bible. It was like it was glowing, and I held it. I open up the Bible. First thing I ever read out of the Bible was Psalms 34, the happiness of those who trust in God. I began to read it and it was everything that just happened to me. Only God can do that. Jordan shared his journey to heaven and hell with his girlfriend, Danica. His voice changed, his eyes changed, his body language changed. Everything about him was new. It was different. So there was no doubting that he had had the experience that he did. My mouth, my words, swearing, everything was like cleansed, like cleansed. I was delivered from any addiction I had. Today, Jordan and Danica are married with two children. They're missionaries preaching the gospel around the world. They're letting everyone know Jesus is real and that he can change the most hardened heart with his love. God loves the broken and loves the lost and he doesn't give up on them. He loves them with all his heart. He leaves the flock to find the one and he did. This is a week of programs of amazing stories, dramatic things that have happened all around the world to people. And uh, you'll see the evidence of the power of God. I'll introduce you to a guy named Khalil. The goals of Khalil's life were simple. Khalil wanted to serve Allah. And he also wanted to take down the infidels. But when Khalil accepted the challenge to do just that, he came face to face with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We lived and trained in the desert for one purpose, to return to Egypt and overthrow the government. We were ready to face any difficulty for the sake of Allah. We cared for nothing but the Islamic call. We had only two choices. One was to die and go to heaven, or survive by winning the battle. I excelled in sharpshooting and trained to be a sniper. Khalil was a rising Muslim religious leader when the emir approached him with a dramatic proposal. Prove the Bible wrong. We vowed to put an end to Christian evangelism, whatever the cost. And that it's the final inspiration. The emir ruled out a military confrontation, instead proposing a logical confrontation in which we would write a book proving the Bible had been altered and couldn't be trusted. This was something that wasn't tried before. Brethren, if you wrote a book that proves their book has been altered... And who would write this book, Amir?
<laughs> What's your problem? Are you afraid of a book, Khalil? I remember my mother says the Christians cast spells and do magic through this book. And whoever reads their book comes under a spell. And a curse. I will not read it. No, no, that's impossible. Don't argue with me, Khalil. If you believe in Allah in the last day, you must do as I say, Khalil. We broke camp in the desert, and I returned home. A month went by without me doing any work. Khalil ultimately decided to follow his orders and research the Bible searching for lies. Instead, months later, Khalil decided the Bible was indeed true. He prayed for God to reveal himself. God, please hear me. Show me your way. All I want, all I ever wanted is to know you and serve you with all my heart and soul. I have loved you since childhood. My whole life is in your hands. God, I'm so confused. I need you. I know you are one God. Are you the God of the Muslims or the God of the Christians? If you are the God of the Muslims, take everything out of my mind except Islam. And if you are the God of the Christians, then bring light to my heart to worship you. God, show me your way. Show me the truth, please, God. That night, I slept deeply, like never before in all my life. When it was nearly done, I had a dream. still have doubts in me? Who are you? I'm the one you're searching for. I can't remember. Read the book. I love the book. Yes, I know. After that dream, Khalil became a changed man. I began to change from that day forward. People who knew me, people at work, all saw the difference in my life. Khalil, do you believe that the Lord Jesus is the I've been a hateful, murderous man. I'd burnt down churches and robbed stores, so many violent acts, but Christ changed my life. Son and Holy Spirit. And I began to act according to what the Bible says. I became a loving person. The sun has set me free. Life is Christ, and death is gain. In the past, death was an ugly, fearful ghost, but death no longer rules. I am now in Christ, and all things are new. According to World News Daily Report posted at worldnewsdailyreport.com, ISIS fighter converts to Christianity after Allah sent him straight to hell. Aleppo, Syria February 23, 2015 An ISIS jihadist has recently converted to Christianity, after being left for dead near the eastern border of Syria, where he was finally rescued by Christian missionaries from the region, reports the Aleppo Herald this morning. The man, that has miraculously survived multiple gunshot wounds after an altercation between ISIS and Syrian army forces, was rescued by members of the St. Dominican Catholic Presbytery of Ayash hours after the conflict had erupted. The members of the Christian organization wanted to give the man a proper Christian burial, and carried him over 26 kilometers, before the man miraculously came back to life, as he was believed to have died from his wounds. As the man came back to his senses, he reported to priest Herman Gruslan of the visions he had whilst in the afterlife, an event that profoundly changed the 32-year-old jihadist, and eventually led to his conversion to Christianity days later.
he told me that he was always taught that to die, as a martyr would open him the gates of Jana, or gates of heaven recalled the priest. Yet, as he had started to ascend towards the light of the heavens, devilish entities, or jinns he called them, appeared and led him to the fiery pits of hell. There he had to relive all the pain he had inflicted upon others and every death he had caused throughout his entire life. He even had to relive the decapitations of his victims through their own eyes, images the jihadist claims will haunt him for the rest of his life, admits the priest. Then Allah, or God, spoke unto him and told him that he had failed miserably as a human soul, that he would be banned from the gates of heaven if he chose to die, but that if he chose to live again, he would have another chance to repent of his sins and walk along God's path once again. The young man claims he was brought back to life moments later and eventually converted to Christianity days later, believing he had been misled throughout his religious life under the worship of Allah. The young man, whose wounds have surprisingly healed in a very short time, has chosen to live amongst the members of the Catholic Presbytery, who rescued him from the desert, and hopes his story will help other ISIS fighters change their ways, and convert to the one and only true Yahweh God, the priest told local the reporters. The problem is in uh, the God of Islam. This is shocking and uh, unfortunately this is the reality uh, about this God. He's a God of torture, he's a God, uh, the deceit God, he, this is what he talks about himself. You are going to make millions, millions upon millions of Muslims very, very angry. I'm not trying to offend uh, Muslims. I love them. Those Muslims are my family. But you are going to offend people and you are going to put your life in danger, aren't you, by doing this? Some of them will be offended. Some of them will be offended. But I am sure, I believe that many of them will walk up. Some of them will try to kill you. They will. They will. If they will kill me, they will kill this body. But the question, what about my soul? What about my ideas? What about my beliefs that I shared with everybody? Will they be able to kill this? I don't think so. These comments are coming from a man who is not just any Palestinian, but the <clears throat> son of Sheikh Hassan Youssef, one of the founders of Hamas. Mosab Hassan is also a young man who himself, until just a few years ago, was president of the Islamic Youth Movement. And his denunciations of Islam are harsh and startling. Every Muslim who read the Quran, if they allow themselves to listen to this Quran and believe in the same time that this is from God, I think they are sick and they need help. I believe that Islam is, is collapsing already. Because it's collapsing? It, yeah, it is collapsing. It looks from the outside, it's growing, but from the inside, it's completely collapsing. It's not uh, giving uh, answers to the people. It's not improving their lives. It's not helping them at all. Within 10 years, that's it. Islam is going to be over. Hamas start to get suspicious about everybody, about themselves, about their wives, about their children, about everybody. If they torture, you're not allowed to say anything. If they uh, kill people, you're not allowed to say anything. If Wait, they teach you, you something they, wrong... They torture and they kill people in the jail? They tortured and they killed people Their own the people? Their own people. Like put noodles uh, uh, under their uh, fingernails. They put needles, needles under the fingernails? Needles under their fingernails. Hamas, Hamas, Hamas leaders, media. Hamas leaders, that we see them on the TVs now, okay? And big leaders were responsible for torturing their own members. In studying the Quran, Moshe Hassan found what he calls thousands of inconsistencies. What Muslims, Muslim sheikhs, or religious people do, that they focus on only one part of Islam. Which part do they focus on? The part that they need for that time. If it's a war zone, if it's war time, they're talking about jihad. They bring the verses that, so it's like very political religion. And this way, I discovered that the Islam is the most bipolar religion on earth, that you can find whatever you want. So the Quran contradicts itself? in so many ways. Within days of us broadcasting that interview, it spread across the internet like wildfire. Days after that, Al-Qaeda itself stepped up in the absence of Hamas making any comment, criticized Hamas for allowing him to get away from the organization, and then concluded their internet statement by quoting the words of the Prophet Muhammad, chilling words. They said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. That being a reference to the fact that Mos Hassan not only has left Hamas, but has now turned his back on Islam and converted to Christianity. I love Jesus immediately. Why? Love your enemy. That was the one that moved me from like deep and changed my life forever. I've been suffering for a long time. It's like my medicine. 
became. It's not a drug. It's not uh, given. It's not like Quran. Quran is a drug. The Quran is a drug. You say Islam is a drug. To be honest with you, uh, being killed is not uh, the worst uh, thing can happen to me. But if my soul is dead, if I, I feel the responsibility and I don't uh, say a, a word of truth, I will die every day. The biggest terrorist is the God of the Quran. I know this is very dangerous, and I know this is. Uh, uh, this will offend uh, many people, but my goal not to offend them. What I'm saying that the biggest terrorist is Allah of the Quran, the God of the Quran, the God of Islam. Since Yusuf's book was published, his father, Sheikh Hassan Yusuf, has publicly disowned his son. I, I want to ask you, of course, to pray for me and pray for my family. They were under lots of pressure. The last time I talked to my dad, he told me, I, told, I asked him to disown me because I know how difficult this is for them. And he told me this is not an option. I know their hearts. They're good people. But unfortunately, their God doesn't have a minimum amount of humanity. He unskinned their humanity. He wants them to be beasts. Our problem is with their God. Our problem is with their ideology. Please don't understand the difference between Islam and Muslims. Please. Muslims are wonderful people. The worst criminal terrorist, Muslim, has moralities, responsibilities, logics than the God of the Quran. And uh, what I see that uh, governments uh, are hunting uh, the um, street drug dealers when they are trying to catch somebody like Bin Laden. How old Bin Laden is? 50 years, 60 years, and the, how long he's going to survive? For the next 15 years, we have a problem with a gangster has been for the last 1400 years and he will be there for the next 500 years if nobody will stop him. And our war is with him. My war is with him. My God's war is with him. If Jesus Christ was here now, right now, and you ask him a question, what do you think about the God of the Quran and the God of Islam? What his answer would be? But I'm telling you, the problem is much bigger than Hamas. The problem is in uh, the God of Islam. This is shocking and um, unfortunately this is the reality about this God, he is a God of torture, he is a God, the, the deceit God, he, this is what he talks about himself. Uh, Islam as a religion in general is a lie wrapped with some facts and truths and I'm talking this uh, with the authority of somebody who understands exactly what Islam is all about and uh, um, uh, it's uh, the biggest lie in history in my opinion and uh, uh, this is the biggest uh, danger that a quarter of population of earth believe that this is a religion but, from but God I ha I have they are wonderful people uh, you know here in Canada our, our Muslim population is, is the same as any other religion so you know those are very this inflammatory words about you I know you've converted to Christianity but that's a pretty inflammatory yeah yes 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 this is this is a good uh, point and uh, what I'm trying to tell you here that your problem my problem the world's problem is not with Muslims and Muslims, the majority of Muslims are great and wonderful people. They are my people. I know their pain, I know their sufferings, and I know their hearts. When you go to the Middle East, when you go to any uh, Muslim uh, community, you see their uh, uh, passion, you see their uh, uh, hospitality, and you get confused, even more confused. You say sometimes, mm -hmm. those Muslims are better than uh, uh, many Christians. And in, we are not in a position to compare people. We are comparing ideologies. And I'm telling you that the minimum Muslim, the most criminal Muslim uh, 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 or terrorist has a minimum of morality, responsibility, logics more than his God. If you read the Quran, if you allow yourself to understand what the Quran is all about, you're going to figure this out yourself. Go to the Quran, Surah 9, verse 5, and you will find what uh, the God of Quran is asking uh, Muslims to do against everybody. Now, it's not Muslims' fault that they were born in that culture. It's not their fault that they were born as Muslims. But what we're telling them, understand your religion before you, uh, be, uh, before you are uh, offended. Those are realities about their religion and they need to recognize that. Your, your father is the, the leader of Hamas in the West Bank. Didn't you feel that you are betraying, betraying your family, betraying his confidence, betraying the idea he dedicated his life to? How, do I, uh, how did I betray him? Uh, by uh, saving his life, for example, I'm not doing him a favor. This is my dad. I know I, I rather to die and he doesn't uh, get uh, hurt. I look like a traitor because I am doing what my people need, not what my people want. You decided at some point to leave Islam altogether and you converted to Christianity, right? Yes, I converted to Christianity. I am a Jesus Christ follower and uh, let me tell you something. I am not a pro-Israeli 
and I'm not very fascinated by uh, the work of the Israeli government of killing uh, Gaza children or assassinating uh, leaders and uh, uh, even terrorist leaders. It's very obvious that they're going to try and kill you to, to the rest of your days and still here you are in Israeli television without disguise, without fear and I ask myself whether this is courage or total uh, uh, craziness. Look, uh, you are afraid when you do something wrong. When you don't do something wrong, when you believe in what you're doing, you're not afraid. Masoub Yusuf, uh, in behalf of myself and many, many Israelis, thank you very much and thank you for this interview. Thank you. Mossab is well aware that by speaking out, he could effectively be signing his own death warrant. But he shows no fear. They gotta kill uh, my ideas first, which is like, that's it. They're already uh, out. So how are they gonna kill my idea? How are they gonna kill my opinions that I have? This thing that they can do, they can't kill my body, but they can't kill my soul. Since childhood, Nabil Qureshi had been a devout Muslim. He was raised in a loving family from a peaceful sect of Islam. The slogan for the sect is love for all, hatred for none. And so growing up, I was taught to love everyone. Nabil pursued his faith with rigor. He prayed five times a day and memorized the Quran in English and Arabic. He was determined to prove that Islam was the only true faith, especially to Christians. When I challenge them on the reliability of the Bible, or when I challenge them on the deity of Christ or the crucifixion, when I challenge them on the Trinity, they would have no answer, and they'd begin a very quick retreat into the realm of faith. I just believe on faith. And I'm thinking, well, you're using the word faith the way I use the word ignorance. Then in his freshman year of college, he saw another side of his faith. I have to answer for myself, what is Islam really? Is it what I've been taught? Is it what these guys are proclaiming? And of course, I was sure it was what I had been taught. It was peaceful. But then how do I explain what's happening on the TV? He wrestled with those images and thoughts for months. Then later that year, he met David, a Christian. Like Nabil, he knew how to defend his faith through logic and reason. David was able to give me reasons to believe in the Bible, reasons to believe that the Bible hasn't been changed, that it's the inspired word of God, that the canon of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, are actually what should be in the Bible and no other book should be in that collection. He had thought about these things. You can't, here's the Despite the differences, Nabil and David became friends and over the next three years often debated about religion. Nabil held on to his beliefs but was running out of arguments. Whenever I started providing reasons to him, that's when he started pointing things out, flaws in my reasoning. It became even clearer when he compared the Bible to the Quran and looked closely at the teachings of Muhammad. It became abundantly clear why people could be so violent in their practice of Islam, because the original teachings of Muhammad, uh, there were some very, very violent teachings found in the traditions of Islam. I'm trying to defend Islam, you know, to my friend who is a Christian. I'm trying to explain to him why Islam is peaceful, why women are, are given equal rights, uh, all these things that I truly believe now I have to defend. And I'm failing miserably because there just was no defense. So I would talk to Nabil saw the only logical conclusion was that Jesus is the Son of God. But admitting that went against everything he had ever believed in. The biggest blasphemy in Islam is to worship anything other than Allah. If there is a chance that Islam could be false, that's a crisis. That's going to shake my world, and it did. And that's what drove me to my knees, and that's when I began to ask, God, who are you? In the Muslim tradition, Nabil asked God to show him the truth through a dream. God gave him three. One in particular had a profound effect. I was standing at the threshold of a narrow door. And this door was just wide enough to fit me, just tall enough to fit me. It was the most poignant symbol in the dream, which is how narrow this door was. I could barely fit in it. And on the other side of this doorway uh, was a room that had been set with a feast. I knew that that room was heaven. And I knew that I had to get into that room if I wanted to be in heaven. Later, he read a passage in the Bible that confirmed his dreams. Convinced of the truth, his world was shattered. Seeking comfort, he reached for the Quran. I pull out the Quran and I start going through its pages and it was a rude awakening that there isn't a single verse in the Quran designed to comfort a hurting man. Not one. And so I put it away, I turned to the Bible, and I went to Matthew and it didn't take long for me to get to Matthew chapter 5 and here's what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so I'm saying to God, God, I know what you want me to do, but I just need time to mourn. I just need time to mourn. 
I just fell in love with the Bible at that moment. It was as if God had written those words specifically for me. He knew 2,000 years ago that I was going to need comfort in this moment, and he knew that I would go to Matthew, so he put that verse in Matthew for me. And I said, okay, this, this is real. This is the Word of God. This faith is where the truth is found. And that's when I ultimately, by reading the Bible, accepted Christ. Nabil started telling people about his new faith, including his parents. He says they were disappointed, but still love their son. He is praying that they will one day accept Christ. So they can know him, so that they can be with him for eternity, so we can all be together for eternity. I can't even imagine, honestly, I can't even imagine going to church with my family. And I would love someday for my father and my mother to be worshiping alongside me. I can't even think about it because I'll just break up. Today, he works for world-renowned apologist Ravi Zacharias and has a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. He is most grateful for the understanding of truth and the gift of eternal life. Jesus was able to resurrect from the dead. He has killed death, and this life is all about life. It doesn't end in death. And there's nothing, nothing more freeing than that. Despite the barbaric acts of ISIS, there is still hope for those living in the world of Islam. Recently, our Chris Mitchell met with Christians in Kurdistan who shared amazing stories of supernatural encounters with Jesus happening throughout the Middle East. As ISIS conquered parts of northern Iraq and persecuted Christian minorities, as Iran continues to suppress religious freedom, a surprising result happened. The gospel actually began to spread. So besides the darkness uh, coming, coming in and trying to get the light and salt out, killing lives and bringing so much pain and suffering, on the other hand, we're seeing a rise of the presence of God, worship, prayer, people experiencing Jesus, and people open up to the gospel and coming to know Him and follow Him, even from Muslim background. Fabian leads a house of prayer in Kurdistan. He told us of meeting people who had supernatural encounters with Jesus. People in these streets, and in these refugee camps from places where ISIS have occupied, even people from here, that are encountering Jesus in, in, in dreams and visions. Those divine encounters are not limited to ISIS-controlled areas. It's a phenomenon happening throughout the Middle East. CBN News met with some visiting Iranians to Kurdistan who wanted to share their stories. We've concealed their identities for their own protection. One night when I was in bed, I had a dream, and the light was speaking as I'm speaking to you now. It was calling my name verbally and saying, come to me, I will save you and I will rescue you. But I didn't understand. That decision soon followed for Abby and her mother. About seven months ago, we made our own decision to follow Jesus with all our hearts. When we came here, they explained about the life of Christ and the kingdom of God according to the gospel. Here we realized that my dream was of Jesus. He is calling us to give us salvation and to give us rest, to give us life. I asked what danger she faces back in Iran. If people knew about my faith, I would be rejected. This is a type of social persecution. If the government knew about my faith, I would be executed or hung in the street at once. Claire came to faith through scripture and a friend. When I was reading the Bible, I couldn't ask others to explain the passage. When I went to university, I met an Armenian girl. I asked her so many questions. How do they live? How do they worship? Many things like that about the Christian life. Her answers brought me to make my own decision. It changed her life. Christ brought me many blessings. I can't describe how faithful Jesus has been, but things which I cannot say in words have happened to me. Whenever I am praying and I'm lifting up my spirit towards God, I do believe and I feel the hand of God touching my heart and shaking my heart. This man, we'll call Dennis, also had a dream. In the dream, I still remember some marks on his face and that he was wearing a crown, a king's crown on his head. A strong brightness came out of each part of his body, and many people were bowing down before him. That dream is still alive in me, and it's with me every day. I remember feeling like I saw heaven. He's shown me many different things since I believed in Jesus, but that dream became a turning point in my life. I asked him if others are coming to Jesus inside Iran. Yes, many people are coming to Christ through dreams. You can't imagine how Jesus is appearing to people. I feel like everybody's looking for a home, looking for the truth. What the Iranian people are going through right now is very difficult. The only one who can change that situation is Christ himself. So please pray and ask others to pray for the people of Iran to experience the power of the resurrection. Iran's mullahs try to quench Christianity in their Islamic Republic. Despite those efforts, missionaries say Iran has one of the fastest growing churches in the world. While politics and extremists rearrange the Middle East, Fabian and others say the Holy Spirit is working at a much higher level 
to change lives. The harvest is very ripe and people are desperate. They, are, they have lost everything, they are in pain, they need help and they are ready to listen and people need to know that. Yes, there's many bad people and they want to kill and destroy, but there's so much more people who are desperate for answers in life. And we as the light and salt, we need to be here for such a time as this, to be His voice and be His hand and bring the gospel of the kingdom to their lives. Chris I hold the gun, the weapon, and the shooting happened. I didn't move, so I stayed still. So they, they let me in the army. So I went through all the training, and I was volunteered to go for frontline uh, to die. You know, you have heard for lots of young kids that they do a suicide bomber because we really believe that what we believe is true. I was born in a Muslim country and uh, I was born in a Muslim fa family for all generation that I could remember. They were all Muslims. And uh, my mother, very faithful Muslim, tried to teach us all the um, laws and uh, principles about the Muslim and make us to practice it. When I remember I was five years old, first when I fast. I really loved God, even though I had uh, not so much experience, but was a very young girl, but I really, really loved God. And I would uh, faithfully uh, do all the activities in society to bring Islam to the practice for everybody, to make sure that then in the school, everybody's doing their job as a Muslim uh, believer, uh, Muslim persons. And I'll... Uh, I got, uh, there was a time that the war started in my country and by then I, I joined the army, uh, very young age, but for the government was not important how old you are. They would give you a gun, uh, they call it GC3 that time, and you hold it and then you shoot. If the gun throw you about one meter, if you could resist that, they would take you in. I hold the gun, the weapon, and the shooting happened. I didn't move, so I stayed still. So they, they let me in the army. So I went through all the training, and I was volunteered to go for frontline uh, to die. You know, you have heard for lots of young kids that they do a suicide bomber because we really believe that what we believe is true and that God is a real God. I'll make this story short. I, I had to run away from my country, and uh, I... I escaped. It took me six months from my country to reach a part of Europe that I could live safely to be able to get a status in any other country. Even in out of country, I started evangelism about Islam and I tried to uh, bring people to Islam because there is a big reward for if you are able to convert anybody to this religion. There, there, there is a big reward that promised uh, for the person who does that. And now, uh, after that, uh, I got the opportunity to meet and to get to know other religions. Back home, I didn't know any religion. All I knew it was Muslim, the one Islam, that I was born into it. And the more I think about the religions, the more I get uh, my faith is strong in Islam because uh, I would come up with questions from the Book of Islam that they couldn't answer me. They didn't have answers and I would, give them the answer from the book of Islam, from Quran. And um, I, I, by God's grace, I could come to Canada. I got a refugee status in Canada. And, I, and then I, I met in Canada, I met Mormons and the Mennonites and uh, um, the same thing. I, I would go into their gathering and bring up the questions. And uh, they were not challenging questions. They was really my own questions that I had. In, in all whole creature, why? You know, I got all those questions and uh, I, I couldn't find any answers. So I keep telling them, I was trying to convince them that still Islam is the best religion. I met a person who came and helped me and my family. And I asked him, what do you believe in? He said, nobody, there is no God. I just believe if you do good, you, you get good. 
And I said, that is my problem. I've been miserable because I've been hanging on to it. some power God, call it God or people call it God. So that's why I'm expecting some help from somewhere that does not exist. So you're probably right. You're doing lots of good things and you don't believe in any God. So I, I start going in that direction, which it didn't really help. I got, I, I became so much miserable. There was a war going inside me. How could you say there is no God? How could you, how, don't you see the sun? Don't you? And I said, okay, I repent. <laughs> and I said, there must be a God. Let's look more. Let's search more. And this, this time was that I, I met uh, with uh, uh, a group that were happy and everything. And they took me to a temple, which is a Buddhist temple. And, um, the first day when I arrived, the priest for the temple came to me and told me all my life. He told, she told me, uh, you were born before and you were a man. I said, okay, that makes sense because I've been carrying all my family, doing all those things that a man should be. I'm very brave and bold and all of that. And it, then she said, you killed somebody and you didn't get the punishment. So you are, as a punishment, you are born again as a woman and you're going through all this suffering. I said, that makes sense because I always ask why why I'm going through so much suffering. Uh, this was not even yet beginning of my suffering and I didn't know that. So I became a Buddhist for a while, practiced that. Uh, but again, that voice inside me, you know, when I go buy apple oranges, put them in front of those statues, something is inside me, laugh at me, said, look at yourself, you're just stupid or something, you know, and I couldn't continue that either. And then uh, after that, it was when my sicknesses started. I got a terrible back pain. And then one day I, I bent and I could not get up anymore. So I stayed bended. I stayed bended and terrible pain. Uh, I went to lots of hospitals to rehab. It was terrible. I would scream from the treatment. I was either sleeping or if I'm awake, I just wake enough to reach the water or something to take some medicine and go back again. Uh, this piece of meat that breeds, you know, there was no other God I could try. I have tried it all. I've tried anything that came on my way. And uh, all I've done in my life was good to others, taking care of my family, trying anything I knew to be good to others. And um, that was the end of my life. I killed myself suicide. Uh, I was unsuccessful. And uh, back to the morphine again. It was worse than that because I never, I was not married. I had no family, never had the children. I never had the time to start my own life. It was all about my family, my country, everything. I was waiting one day to start my own life, you know, to get married, to have children, all of that. And when they told me, you won't die, but this is it. You're going to be a piece of meat. I, and uh, I was so in a bad shape that they even didn't know how to put me in a car because I would not be, I couldn't sit or I couldn't lie down or I couldn't uh, stand. It was just so bended like this with the pain continually. I, I needed some help because the place I rented, it was so messy. I needed somebody that can stand straight, come and take the garbage out or do something. So I went out uh, uh, trying to find somebody and I saw this guy who was a uh, drug addict. I said, I need help if you could come and do some help help with at the house clean up or something i give you some money and he said a, a sandwich and a, a cigarette pocket cigarette would be enough i said okay so he, uh he was helping me to get to house and then we passed by a small little building and he said um do you like to dance i said oh i always love to dance they said you know these people dance for free you can come and go there every evening they dancing on sundays i said okay so i went there on sunday and uh, um, I entered to this, they were, they were dancing, they were singing, they were worshiping. And somebody told me, welcome to the church. I said, is this a church? They said, yes. I said, where is the stuff? He said, this is a church. I said, where is your statues? Where is, uh, like, I never seen this church before. This is like a big room, people just dancing. And that was a born again church that I got introduced for the first time to. I went in the church and uh, of course I couldn't dance or anything just on the floor. And uh, by the end of the worshiping, I asked God, I said, Lord, I didn't know his name, but God or Lord. I just said, is there, is there anything? Is there anything there? I'm at the end. This is the end of it for me. 
If there is anything, show me yourself. And if it's not, that's it. I'm done with everything. There is no other way. I have tried all the religions that are in the market. <laughs> I have tried everything. I have tried all the doctors or everything. I'm just piece of meat. What is the purpose of this? And then uh, when I was crying um, on there, on my knees, and then all of a sudden, I, I, I just saw this light. It was so bright. It was so bright. And I, 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 I just said, who is this? Who is this? And then he said, I am Jesus. And then I start beating myself. Oh, all these years I heard your name, but I always have, I have what is stupid. I am so you are real. So you are real. It says, I am the truth. I am true. And then <laughs> every time I, think, and then the, he touched me, you know, he just put his hand on my head. Like I went all the way to the top. I didn't know what was going on in me. Uh, and then I, it, it took long because I was just saying, forgive me for not believing that you are real and forgiving me. And I was just saying that. And then uh, when I, when I came to the, when I came back again, I, I, I saw ladies, they were holding me. I, I didn't know. I don't know when they came around me. I didn't know it's anybody around me. And they just kissed me and said, you okay? I said, yes, yes. And they said, wow, it's the beautiful smell here. We, we know we, we could smell the Lord. I said, I, I saw him. And then uh, they helped me to get up. And I, I just stood up straight. I had no pain and I could just stand up so straight and I never had any, I never been in hospital since then except for my baby that I had to have a baby and uh, I walked myself I came home I just didn't want to sleep anymore I just want to stand up I want to do things it was just like I got a new life and now uh, I, I keep looking at myself in mirror that I'm standing straight. My face was different. I look so different. And uh, and after that, I didn't know what happened to me for a week. I, I thought I'm crazy. I, I thought, how could that be? What's going on? And, uh, and then Lots of bad things start happening to me. Like my house got on fire, everything. And I remember I just would stand in the mirror. I said, I saw him. I'm not going back. I saw him. I am healed. I am healed. I can walk. I have no pain, no surgery, nothing. I am. I have so much health. You know, I used to say, I have so much health. Nowhere in my body hurt. You know, before every piece of body was hurt, my heart even was hurting. My emotion, my everything. I had just this new hope for life that, oh, I can have a life again. I know I was trained as a soldier and everything, but this was even worse than a physical war because then my people come on my way, the professor from university, all those Muslim guys, uh, people, everything. They were, I was just all of a sudden, I, I get all these Muslim people around me that are uh, trying to stop me from talking about the miracle that happened in my life and i keep i i keep you know maybe you won't believe it even on sunday i want to go back and some strong power would hold me back and i lift my leg and i put it there and like step by step until i make it to the church and then i just say help me pray for me you know because i couldn't be baptized for two years right every time they plan something bad happened that it stopped my baptism in the water it was such a, a struggle going on, but all I would say, I said, no, I saw him. I saw him is the truth, is the truth. I never felt alone after that, never. I would hear his voice, every, even if I'm alone under the blanket. <laughs> I never felt lonely. And I had such amazing peace. And I had so much hope for life again. 
uh, God told me to go and see my family and give them the news before I go and say nothing about Lord. And then this, this was after two years praying. And in one month, my whole family had vision of Jesus Christ and they all came to Lord, my mother, my brothers, my sisters. Um, this, this really makes me understand the song that amazing grace that I was, how miserable I was, how, how miserable I was when I was a Muslim. And I thought I was really a uh, holy in fasting and praying all of that. And yet I was so restless and sick and hopeless. My name is uh, Nancy Chandy, and uh, what I want to share today is about my um, experience, I, basically my testimony of how Jesus revealed himself to me, took me to heaven, and also took me to hell. I was in front of this this huge uh, gate, this gate which with, it, 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 sh it was shining like uh, with, with so much of radiance and so much of light and uh, and the gate was like it was as if covered with with jewels or, or you know precious stones and there was so much of light and glory coming from this gate where I, I was having a hard time even looking and and the gate just opens and an angel comes out and the angel says come in it's just as you read in the word, the streets are made of gold and it, there's, there's, there's this brilliance and light, there's this joy. And, and one thing that I really experienced stepping into heaven is peace, is a peace, uh, uh, you know, peace and love. It's like, you know, all your cares and all your worries just, just fade away and you just forget about everything that, about, about the earth. And uh, after some time, I knew that there was, there was someone coming towards, there was some, some power, some, some force coming towards me. But, but at the same time, this feeling of love beyond explanation, you know, was coming towards me. And I turned and the next thing I went boom to the floor and it was Jesus. And Jesus has said, come, I have things to show you. And the, and the next thing I know, I'm, in, I'm standing in this beautiful garden beautiful garden garden filled with flowers of all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors that I have never seen on this earth uh, uh, you know with different blends of colors there was very tiny flowers to big flowers medium-sized flowers, all kinds and the beauty about this garden was that the flowers were singing praises to the king the flowers were singing praises the the fragrance the the smell it was just so um, so beautiful where you could just stand there and just just worship God you know and the next place is I found myself standing in this uh, river uh, this crystal clear river and it, it was so clear it's like as if you could see all the way down and I was standing right in the middle but not sinking I, I was not sinking but I, I was, it was so peaceful and it was crystal clear so pure the water you know one thing about being there in heaven was that J Jesus didn't have to explain to me this is you know this is that or this is that there was a knowing in my heart it was as though he was communicating to me in my in my spirit uh, in you know and, and and I just turned and I saw this huge throne there was no end no beginning of this throne and this throne was made of precious gems i mean the i mean it was it was hard for me to even look at it but it was huge uh, and from from this uh, if i could say from the center from the center of this throne was this river was flowing from the center of the throne and going all through heaven or i mean all around heaven from the river the next place that i was was jesus said look and what I saw was rows and rows and rows of, uh, you know, it, it seemed like it was some, some construction taking place, rows and rows of it. And on top of each of the doors, there was a plaque. And on, on this plaque, and what I was allowed to see was especially this plaque, and each of the plaque had a name. And the name was, it was not English, but it was a name, and I just knew it was the name of, the, of, of a person. Of each time someone gives their life to the Lord, there is a celebration, there is, there is jubilee in heaven that takes place. And immediately there is, uh, the, there is a mansion that is being, being built for every child of God that, whose name is written in the book of the Lamb. And after I had seen all of this, I said, Jesus, I don't want to go back. I want to stay with you. I want to be with you forever. I want to stay here. And he, and he said, there's one more place I have to show you. And the next place that the Lord took me to was dark. It was really dark. I was standing like, like the edge of it was like standing on the edge of a cliff. And he said, look down. And even before I could look down, I, I, I could hear these 
the screaming, this, this, no, the, uh, you know, screaming in pain, screaming in agony, screaming out, help, help, help. And it was pitch dark, but I knew that Jesus allowed me at that moment in time to see what was down there. And what I saw was, was horrific. It was, it was horrible. I, I saw bodies of men and women. They were naked bodies of men and women just running and screaming and, and crying out for help. I saw these these demonic, scary, ugly, demonic figures were reminding them, reminding them of the mistakes they have done, constantly reminding them, reminding them. And, and, and then the next thing that I saw was these, these claws, these creatures, they had these claws, they would just tear the backs of the men and the women and, 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 the, and they would be just screaming, the men and the women, that they were, they were being scratched and torn apart, were just screaming. And, and the agony is that you never die there. I, I, I couldn't I, I, I couldn't say a word. It was just I was just breaking. It's like I could feel the compassion that Jesus had. Je I looked at Jesus' face and I saw compassion in his eyes. But there's nothing he could do too, because they chose their destiny. The the smell was like if you have smelled sulfur, uh, a, a, a times a gazillion or a million times that smell. The stench was horrible. The stench was horrible, and the darkness is it's like a terrorizing darkness in there. And, and Jesus said, look, and I, and I looked and I saw faces of people. There was like so, just faces just popping up, uh, popping up down there. And I looked and I said, but Jesus, these people are alive because I, there are some that I, did, I knew. And I, and, I, and I knew some of them as to be even ministers. I said, but they're alive. And Jesus said, this is why I'm sending you back to speak the truth, to speak the tr truth because my church is perishing. My body is perishing. And after that was said, I was back. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there is no other place in between. You go either to heaven or you go either to, uh, to hell. And now is the time it, you know, to, to examine our hearts, just examine our hearts. Where are we going? Where is our destiny going to be? What kind of a life are we living? Are we, are we one when we are outside uh, uh, in front of people and living another life behind closed walls? We can fool man, we can fool our family, we can fool uh, you know, our spouses, but God Almighty sees everything. Holy Spirit sees everything, but He is a merciful and a compassionate God. He is standing with arms open wide in front of us, in front of you today and saying, come. All we have to do is to surrender and repent. It's time for the church to come back to the first love. I think that is the punchline of today. Is this uh, the message for the hour? Come back to the first love. Come back. It's for the it's for the church, the sleeping giant, to wake up. So, so today, choose heaven or hell. Law practice is a stressful environment and you're dealing with a lot of very difficult situations. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach every morning, feeling that stress. He just was burdened by work. I mean, that was always on his mind. You know, it was, it was a hard thing for him to turn off on the weekends or, or to get away from it. I was just focused so intently on my career that I was letting what's really important fall by the wayside. Jeffrey Thompson's law practice didn't take just his time and energy. The fast pace and the constant stress also took a toll on his body. I maintained that stress and it continued to work on me and it also continued to work on my body. And eventually it broke down. I began having stomach pains, severe stomach pains that, that I initially, I just had no idea what it was. I thought I had an appendix rupture. Jeffrey had developed diverticulitis, a painful condition that attacks the intestinal wall. Months of natural treatments had failed and his condition had become so advanced he needed surgery to remove part of his intestine. But what looked like a textbook operation left him suspended between life and death. And I woke up to a surgeon pulling a sheet off of my stomach. And as I looked down, I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. And then I looked into the surgeon's eyes and I could see concern on his face. He had been hemorrhaging for almost 24 hours. And they had continually given him blood, but it was hemorrhaging into his abdomen, and they didn't know it, into his stomach. It was frightening. I've never seen anyone so, so pale, but his, his lips were just completely white. My internal clock told me that I was getting ready to die, and I only had a few seconds of consciousness left. I reached up to grab my wife. I was just wanting to tell her how much I loved her and tell her that I was getting ready to leave her. And, and I went to him, and it was right after that I lost him. You know, I could 